Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. My name is Dr. Matt Rogers, and I'm the acting director of the Merle McQueen Ferguson Center. Uh, our center is dedicated to the co collaborative, action-oriented research and education to address family violence and violence against women and children. The MMFC was established through the collaborative efforts of the University of New Brunswick and the Merle McQueen Ferguson Foundation. And November has been designated Family Violence Prevention Month, and in recognition of this, we are pleased to be hosting a series of Lunch and Learn webinars uh, delivered by experts in this field. Today's session, Domestic and Intimate Partner Violence and the Workplace Tools That Can Help, is the fourth in our series for this month. Uh, but before we get started, we'd like uh, to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge that UNB and the and New Brunswick reside on the unsurrendered and unceded lands of the Wolistiqua, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. This region is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which the Wolistiqua and Mi'kmaq people first signed with the British Crown in 1725. Uh, the treaties recognize Mi'kmaq and Wolistiqua title and established the rules for an ongoing relationship between nations and did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources. And it is important that, as we're all treaty people, that we take time to reflect on this history, that relationship, and that we all act on the critical task of truth and reconciliation. We must also recognize and live up to the responsibilities we all have in these territories to that end. The presentation portion of our Lunch and Learn will be recorded and made available on our website uh, in a couple weeks. As we're using the webinar function of Zoom, your video and sound are automatically turned off. Uh, but we do have time allocated uh, following the presentation for a Q&A with the presenters. And to participate in this portion, please post your questions using the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen. Questions may be made at any time throughout the presentation and may be submitted anonymously if you choose. So if you have a question uh, while you're hearing our presenters today, please feel free to post it uh, while you have the question. And then uh, when we have some time at the end, we'll address those questions um, and we'll get through as many as, as, as an amount of time we have. So at the end of the Lunch and Learn, we'll also be providing a very brief link uh, to an evaluation. And your feedback is important for us because it's going to inform us uh, about how we can make necessary improvements for future sessions. So now I'd like to welcome and introduce our two speakers for today. Barry McKnight has experience in addressing domestic and intimate partner violence from an intervention perspective, as well as through prevention and education activities during his 28-year 28 career, 28 career in policing. He was a member and chaired for 18 months uh, the NB Domestic Violence Death Review Committee from 2010 to 2016. And after his retirement from policing in 2012, he has been in, engaged in pro-feminist activism and efforts to eradicate men's violence against women through the White Ribbon Federation, White, White Ribbon Fredericton. Lindsay Manuel holds a law degree from the University of New Brunswick and a Bachelor of Science from St. Mary's. She has worked with the Women's Equality Branch since 2009, and her areas of work include intimate partner violence intervention, uh, second stage housing programs, danger assessment, DIPV in the workplace, coordinated community response, and the NB Silent Witness Project. Before joining the branch, she worked in the nonprofit field for about nine years, including with uh, Public Legal Education and Information Services of New Brunswick. Uh, so now I will hand the floor over to our guests. Uh, so please welcome me, uh, please help me in welcoming, welcoming, welcoming them. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction and the land acknowledgement. Um, I think it's really important for us to reflect on that, especially considering the topic of intimate partner violence and the impact that colonization has had on Indigenous people, particularly regarding intimate partner violence. So I'm really glad you shared that with us. So Barry and I are pretty excited to be here today. And we're so honored that the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center invited us to talk about It's Your Business, a Workplace Toolkit. Um, 
today we're not going to focus as much on what is domestic and intimate partner violence, but we really wanted to share some practical tools with you. So we'll give you a little overview of the toolkit, show you the website, and share a tool that we think everyone can take back to their workplace to help support victims of intimate partner violence. Do you want to add anything in there, Barry? No, I, I just uh, I completely agree. This is uh, you know a real pleasure to be able to talk to you folks about the toolkit. It's an amazing resource. There's been a, like so much work that has uh, that has gone into it, and uh, for you know any kind of business, but in particular, I keep thinking about smaller businesses who really need these kind of resources to help guide them through some of the difficult. Um, things that they encounter with, with uh, you know, any of their, their staff for, um, you know, a myriad of reasons, so. Yeah, I think you're right there. So if we want to go to the next slide, it's, uh, this shows you some of the people that are involved with this committee, but it's not a new committee. It really started in the late 1990s out of some of the work from the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center and the research of Dr. Joy Mighty. At that time, she was looking at the impact of violence on the workplace and it was really groundbreaking. People hadn't really thought of it in that context. It was often thought of as a personal private issue and it was totally separate from the workplace. But through Joy's research, it really showed there was an impact both on the workplace and on the victim and their fellow employees. So because the center is so proactive and really keen on doing that action-based research, we looked at how can we get this information into the hands of those that can use it? How can it be usable for workplaces, employers, and employees? So in around 2003, the first Family Violence on the Workplace Toolkit was launched. And at that time, there were lots of different partners, but it was through a funding grant that was a partnership between the Ferguson Foundation and the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce. And so we received this business action plan funding and it was truly a collaboration between those that worked in the sector and the business community. So it was going to be practical. And the toolkit had been used for many years and then and we were one of the first toolkits in Canada and others used it as a model, which is great. And we encourage them to use our information. But then we recognized that we needed to update it and include more information. So in 2019, the toolkit got a total revamp. All of the fact sheets were revamped and um, new kind of areas of research came out, including things on diversity and trauma. So, so one of the important aspects is looking at why this should be important to businesses. Now we say it's your business, but why? According to a Canada Labour Congress survey, one third of all employees have been impacted by domestic and intimate partner violence. And for those individuals, they've said it has impacted their workplace. So not only is it impacting someone personally, but it has an impact on the workplace due to things like absenteeism, loss of productivity, all of those things. So this toolkit can help employers and employees navigate the information 
to help them deal with a situation where there is intimate partner violence, how to help support their employees and make sure they're maintaining a safe, respectful workplace for everyone. So if you go to our website and it is toolkitnb.ca, it brings you to a landing page. You can choose English or French and this is what you will see. And so there's lots of different tabs and lots of information that really can help support employers in supporting their employees. So I'm gonna hand it over to Barry and he's gonna talk about some of the tabs that you will see. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. The, the, the website is, is our, our, can serve as a really as a go to for any organization that uh, wants to learn about the impacts of IPV on the workplace uh, in particular. So you're looking at the landing page now, and we're going to talk uh, a little bit about the about the fact sheets. Um, which, uh, you know, as you will see, when you pull down the fact sheet tab, you'll see a number of the, uh, the fact sheets. And there are a couple of new ones that are on that list that we'll refer to in, um, uh, in a few minutes. But you can see that they cover uh, a number of different topics that are, are really important for any employer, right down to the basics. What is domestic and intimate partner violence? Why an employer uh, should care? Um, and talking about the impacts of DIPV uh, on the workplace. And there are many different factors, many kinds of uh, impacts in the workplace. You know, not just, you know, ranging from obviously the physical and mental well being of uh, victims and survivors, as well as their colleagues, um, to the, you know, productivity and, and some of the all aspects of, uh, of a business or any kind of organization. Uh, are impacted. Um, more fact sheets, domestic intimate partner violence, in the law, support of the workplace, policies, practices, and programs. There's linkages for those uh, of us who are here in New Brunswick. There are linkages to Workplace New Brunswick because, you know, one of, there is also uh, uh, workplace safety laws that employers are required to comply with. And so there's, a, there's a impacts there uh, as well. And then you can download the complete toolkit if that's the way that you want to interact uh, with it so that you've got uh, you know an actual printed copy that you could have bound and in your office good thing for anybody to have access to supervisors and and managers uh, uh, in order to get the information that they're looking for when dealing with some kind of uh, of an emerging uh, issue with staff person so there's there's really great uh, Really great resources uh, there. Um, these are some more of the fact sheets. This is the comprehensive list uh, of what fact sheets are, are there now. And some of the some of the newer fact sheets are a couple of new ones are, are at the bottom uh, concerning trauma informed um, uh, issues in the workplace. Um, respecting diverse employees, abusers in the workplace. Uh, you know, this is a really interesting and relevant aspect that any organization has to deal with. Of course, we think about, um, um, we think about the impact of DIPV and I think automatically our minds go to, uh, to, to victims and survivors. But in many circumstances where DIPV is impacting a workplace, it may be because they have um, the abuser uh, in, in their workplace. And in some cases, um, they may have both the abuser and the victim or, or survivor in the workplace. And so there are some complexities as one can imagine to those. There's also a fact sheet on uh, red flags and risks regarding DIPV, course of control and, uh, and domestic uh, homicide, which is, uh, which is very important for us to be, uh, to be aware of for any, any organization. Uh, in the resources uh, tab on the website, um, there are also, there's a couple of things that we were gonna pay some attention to, one of which is the, the safety plan that we'll get to in a couple of minutes. There are also some, some interesting uh, uh, videos um, just to sort of help 
uh, you know, sort of nurture and understanding with an employer about some of these conversations that they may uh, find themselves needing to have with an employee who is experience, experiencing DIPV uh, in the workplace. And we'll just kind of look at one of those uh, now. These are our links to uh, videos that came from uh, uh, WorkSafe British Columbia. And we're just going to play this, uh, this one. <laughs> Thanks for telling me about the restraining order you have against your partner. Let's chat about what we can do to make you feel safe at work. My partner calls me at work a lot. It scares me. We can arrange to screen your calls. And should we change your emergency contact to someone other than your partner? Uh, yes, uh, please use my friend Chris. Sometimes I get nervous walking to my car alone. We'll get security to walk you to your car. Would you like a parking spot closer to the building? That would help me feel safer too. You work near the main entrance. It would be safer to move you to a different area. Thank you. So this is the restraining order, right? I'm going to share this with security. Okay, but does that mean everyone will know? This will be kept confidential. Only those who need to know for safety reasons will be told. What should I do if my partner threatens to come here and hurt me? We have a workplace safety plan to deal with threats of violence. Let's go over it. Okay. I'm not sure if you all would have seen the video or if you just heard it. I didn't see it actually play, but Mary, maybe Barry and I can act it out for you. Just joking, we won't. But it is a very short video, but I think it really speaks volumes. It shows how simple it is to start the conversation with someone to talk about safety. And I'm not saying it's easy for anyone to do because this is often a very difficult conversation to start, but it can be very simple by letting someone know that you've noticed something's going on and that you're worried about them. And then looking at those things that can help make them safer. So we do like to, to show that video to kind of give people the idea of how they can start this conversation. And there is another video clip there as well too that is about starting the conversation in general about domestic and intimate partner violence. That again is a very short video, but really speaks volumes. So, the other part that we wanted to talk about besides sharing the resource of the video with you is what is an individual safety plan. And this is really based on the workplace. When you think about it, often victims seek help and access it through maybe uh, domestic violence coordinate outreach worker or maybe a transition house or someone else that can help support them but we really need to make sure we're looking at safety within the workplace too because sometimes a victim can move somewhere else to a safe and secure location maybe the abusive partner doesn't know where they are but guess what between 8.15 and 4.30, this person is at work or whatever their work schedule is. And generally the abusive partner knows where they are. They can use the workplace to access their victim. So this is a snapshot of one of the pages of the individual safety plan. We adopted it from the center at Western Ontario, and they gave us permission to use it. We use it within government and 
It's on the Workplace Toolkit website. It's free to use. It's free to adapt to however will work best in your workplace. And when we're, when we're talking about a safety plan, we really want to make sure people have some ideas for measures that they can take. Because often people haven't sat down and talked about domestic and intimate partner violence and what the response should be. So when someone's in a crisis, it's really hard to come up with some of these ideas and how someone's safety could be enhanced at the workplace. So this gives ideas. It is, it is not for one particular workplace. It really can be used and tailored to what, what might work for you. And the ideas that we share in this, it's not an exhaustive list of everything that can be done to help enhance the victim safety. There might be other things specific to that situation or to that victim or survivor that can be done. And which kind of brings me to the fact that we need to remember that this is the victims or survivors individual safety plan. Make sure this is communicated with them, that you're talking with them about what measures need to be taken or could be taken to help support them. Sometimes we get in our own way. We really want to help. And so we think we know what this person should be doing. But it is not our decision. We need to make sure the victim gets the information that they need and can make an informed decision about some of these safety measures. So it is their safety, uh, their individual safety plan. So with that, I think Barry's going to take you through some of the uh, some of the different measures that someone might take, and then I think we're going to invite, as we go, some some comments in the chats about what you might do. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. The uh, yeah, as we start talking about just a few aspects of of the safety plan, we we'd like to get some feedback from you as we move along about things that you can think of in your own workplace. Uh, you know. That, that could apply as options. And again, that's just to put us all in that mindset of thinking creatively about small things that could be done to make adjustments or even to have the discussion about, about a, a safety plan for, for an employee. So, um, you know, we start with, first of all, the, um, as you can see from the form of the, the, the safety plan form itself, it provides uh, individual safety plan options. So uh, on this first page, the guideline, when they're talking about alternative work arrangements, adjusting the employee's work arrangements in accordance with available policies, practices, or work specific flexibility. And then in the next column, it talks about you know, some of the options that you could consider. So it, it moves you uh, along that process by providing examples of things that might apply to your workplace. Uh, and of course, there are many different kinds of workplaces. So some of these things don't apply perhaps in a straightforward manner. So some of the safety planning steps that you'll see as you go through it is, is obviously how to have that discussion. Like Lindsay mentioned, there's another video about starting that discussion uh, with an employee, which is not easy, but I think it's more straightforward than, than people might think that it is. This should be a victim-centered, survivor-centered uh, process. What I simply mean by that is that that person plays a key role and we need to speak openly and honestly with them and, and make it clear to them that we're reaching out to them and that we're concerned. Employers also have a duty just, you know, we may discuss further this balance that 
Of course, much of this depends on the wishes of uh, the victim or survivor, but also uh, employers have a duty to all of their staff to make sure that people are safe. So that's not a competing interest, but there are two things that need to be kept in, in mind at all times. So how that discussion happens, you know, the same as any, there are some things that you should talk about, some things that you shouldn't talk about being non-judgmental, expressing concern, obviously. Um, documenting um, the, the process uh, is also key in the safety plan and, and also things that you may talk to a victim or survivor about the documenting some of the things that have happened to them. Obviously, depending on the nature of, of what they're experiencing, there may be discussions about who they've reached out to, whether or not they have had any contact uh, with the police or, um, or, or domestic violence, outreach workers, any support services that, that are available. That's important to, uh, to think about uh, as well. Um, the, the personal safety um, in, in the workplace is an interesting option. And again, you can imagine from very small workplaces, if you think about a small retail business, for example, um, you know, what are, what are the different, you know, kinds of, of options that might be available for a person to, to, to be safe in the workplace and making uh, adjustments as you can. Um, if it's an office, maybe it's relocating workstations. Uh, any of those types of things are, are options that may help uh, a person. So uh, again, this is to some degree a, a process in, in creative thinking about things that can be done to help. There's also mention of options with um, email and the phone. Uh, uh, the the uh, organization's presence on the internet. Do they have um, names? And and in some cases, some organizations have photos of those who work there, who are on their team. Is a common thing that you may see on a website. And those are things that can be can be considered to make adjustments. An organization that has different locations. Um, that's also an option. Are they? Can they? Are they working? at the same location? Can they go to another location in the, the same city? That sort of thing. Anything you want to add to that, uh, Lindsay? Or are, are we ready to hear any ideas from our audience about things that they think they could do? I would be really interested to hear from the participants. Now, and we had talked about that discussion piece and where do you have that discussion? Not all places are set up to have a quiet, uh, private spot for discussion. So I'm interested for our participants, maybe you can share it in the chat. Where in your workplace do you think would be appropriate to have a private um, sensitive discussion? Yeah, if you work in a, let's say a fast food restaurant, um, you know, where could that happen? Private space may be, you know, at a premium. I mean, in some locations, there's a very small office where a supervisor um, does some of their work, but, um, but otherwise, not a whole lot of privacy. Someone mentioned sometimes I go for a walk with an individual if it, no private area is available. That's a good idea to get out of the office, go for a walk to be able to have that discussion. Yeah, that would certainly achieve, um, you know, the privacy and uh, the privacy requirement. Um, you know, I suppose there's before work for a few minutes or after work for a few minutes, you know, keeping in mind that that, that you know, we, we, we need, need to be cautious with keeping people too long after their work is finished. But, 
you know, in circumstances when you can't find a private place, there, there may be options like that as well. And someone mentioned uh, that in a former role, they had a boardroom uh, in another building that they used. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of offices, I think, do sort of make it a, a little bit easier in the structure of the office where it's not uncommon that private meetings are, are held in boardrooms or in the supervisor's office and, and that sort of thing. They think it's important for us to be flexible and creative for some things. There might not be a spot to talk in a construction site, mm -hmm. but making that effort to recognize this is important and finding that spot to talk. Um, and again, that flexibility and creativity, you know, is it two people sitting in the front of a car talking? Is it, you know, going for a walk or borrowing someone else's boardroom or whatnot? But there are ways to make it happen. And I think we really help to support victims when we make it a safe environment for them to be able to talk freely about what's going on. Yeah. Someone mentioned, you know, an office with a closed door would be the ideal uh, for confidentiality, but we must work with what we have. That reminds me of, you know, Barry, you mentioned, you know, the process of creative thinking and talking about small businesses, but another group that this would apply to, I think, is uh, small not-for-profit organizations where they have, they don't necessarily have the HR support um, or the space, uh, you know, so this is the type of tools that I can see would really help um, with that, with, with that area as well. Um, with the same, I guess they would have the so similar limitations, but it's again going around the the uh, being going down the creative route of being able to find ways to to ex to uh, address those needs of the of employees. Yeah. Yeah, and being committed to that conversation being the the number one part, and of course, you know, another forum for that discussion, which I guess is is obvious, is it may be a virtual connection mm. with with someone based on, you know, some of the restrictions that have existed through, throughout the pandemic, there were not options at times for some folks to have a face-to-face -face, um, meeting with a, with a supervisor and that it was very much the way that we're, we're meeting today, which, you know, is maybe, maybe what you're left with. Yeah, uh, and that that has to be, I guess, doing virtual calls and, and webinars and those types of things from home have been identified sometimes to be higher risk because individuals staying at home and then you have all of the risk that's there. But yes, that is another avenue as well with uh, access to mobile devices. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The complexity and, and relying on the uh, on the, the judgment. Of, of victims and survivors to send those signals about mm -hmm. um, this is the place to meet. We need to we need to trust them when if if they were to indicate as you just said, it can't be a Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, with a little more discussion about the uh, different aspects of the safety planning and. And again, if you go through, if you go to the website and look through that safety planning document, you're, you're going to see, I'm not going to go through all of these, but making, uh, making changes around inside the workplace, changes to, um, you know, whether it's uh, email, the phone system, the intranet, whatever physical changes are things that, that can be uh, considered along the way um, as well. Tanya recommended, she said, once uh, one could suggest meeting at a local library where it's public uh, and you can find a, a quiet spot or a beach. Yeah, not this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a great idea. It would certainly pri be private this time of year. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think people have, I'm just uh, flipping through <laughs> the next few slides, which I think we've, yeah. we've covered and we've talked about what measures that one could take in their uh, uh, workplace. Um, so that new tools uh, as well, or new uh, 
uh, options in the fact sheets talking about when you have the victim or survivor and the abuser working together. What are what are the options there? This is this is uh, um, obviously there are you know uh, difficulties and and certainly complications around around managing that and. Um, you know, large workplaces, this is not news to anyone. When both parties are in the workplace, um, there, are, there are workplaces at times that become fractured in supporting one person or another. And it's really important for the organization to be able to uh, address those sorts of things. And again, in a victim-centered approach, being able yeah. to talk to the victim and survivor about what works best for them in, in dealing with things. And obviously there's the mention of restraining orders mentioned if obviously if there's any sort of court mandated um, uh, order then the organization needs to be uh, very much aware of that. Mm. Okay, so one of the things in the safety plan, the individual safety plan, it's talking to the employee about some of the resources out there, some other options. So I just wanted to share a couple of provincial laws that really can be tools that can help victims and survivors um, kind of take some control, make some decisions, um, have a little bit of support for what they're trying to do um, or to enhance their safety. So I'm just gonna tell you a little about an amendment to the Employment Standards Act, as well as the Residential Tenancies Act and the Intimate Partner Violence Intervention Act. So what is very exciting, we can go to the next slide and that is with the Employment Standards Act. It was relatively recently, I think it was September of 2018, when the domestic intimate partner or sexual violence leave came into place in New Brunswick to help support victims or their dependent children um, when they're dealing with domestic intimate partner violence or sexual violence. So this amendment allows individuals who are victims or survivors to take up to 10 days of what we call intermittent leave. So that's if you need a day here or there to deal with some aspect of the intimate partner violence that you were subjected to and up to 16 weeks of leave together. So that needs to be in a continuous period of time. And with the first five days being paid leave. And although we recognize that five days isn't, um, isn't really a lot, I think it's important for us to recognize that this domestic intimate partner or sexual violence leave is the first paid leave under the Employment Standards Act. So the fact that victims can access that. Now, if a victim or survivor, you know, took their 10 days intermittent leave and then they needed the other leave to help deal with the impacts of the violence. If they, oh, after nine weeks, they thought, okay, I'm ready to go back to work, they wouldn't be able to access those other seven weeks. It really needs to be together. And this is during one calendar year. So what they need to do is they need to be able to provide in writing to their employer the reason why they're taking this leave. So you can see the list of purposes there. That is what they need to give their employer. There is no other sort of written verification or anything. They need to say whether it's for, you know, seeking another place to live, if they're seeking some kind of counseling, 
whatever it is. And if you look at the last one, that's kind of the catch all. It's about all the impacts of domestic and intimate partner sexual violence. So it is very exciting that victims can now access this. So what it does is not only does it give them the ability to access those services, but it makes sure that they are not fired while they're dealing with the impacts of the intimate partner violence. So it provides that job security. Now, unfortunately, currently individuals can't access employment insurance for domestic and intimate partner violence leave, at least not at this time. Hopefully there'll be a change in the future. The next one that I wanted to talk about is the early termination of a lease. And that's in cases where there's domestic, intimate partner, sexual violence or criminal harassment, which we generally know as stalking. So this allows for a tenant to terminate their lease early if they're a victim of intimate partner violence or any of those types of violence. Um, and generally it changes a notice period from three months to one month. Now, what is required for this is that the tenant must give the landlord notice that they're going to do this and provide them with either a court order, some other kind of restraining order, or what's called a third party declaration or verification, which means that someone from the domestic violence sector, so outreach worker, second stage, transition house, um, someone from police, someone from an educational institute, a nurse, a doctor, it's a wide variety of individuals could fill this out and say, to the best of my knowledge, this person has been subjected to domestic and intimate partner violence. So it really provides people the opportunity to end a, to terminate a lease early so they're not financially responsible for that apartment or location when they're not able to reside there because of the intimate partner violence. The last one that I wanted to share with you are emergency intervention orders. And this is under the Intimate Partner Violence Intervention Act. And what this provides is for temporary, it's very important to recognize that they're temporary remedies to help enhance the safety of victims and to also give them a little more time to make some longer term decisions rather than have to make it in that moment of crisis. And it's to be used in cases when things are serious and urgent. And it's not up for us to make that determination, but the hearing officers or emergency adjudicative officers, they're the ones who receive the applications and hold the hearings. What is different is that they actually hold the hearings over the telephone. So it makes it a little more accessible and a little more speedy than some other types of intervention. And there can be different provisions such as the temporary care and custody of children, the exclusive occupation of the residents. It could include the removal of firearms, which we know is very important because the presence of firearms is a risk for lethality in situations of uh, domestic violence. And it could also be the exclusive possession, the temporary exclusive use and possession of personal property, which would include pets as well, because we know sometimes pets are a barrier to people being able to leave an abusive relationship. So that is available and to access it, someone needs to access what we call a designated assister. So that's someone that can help support them, help fill out the application and submit it and be there during the hearing to support them. So that would be a police officer, both municipal and RCMP, victim services, 
both police and the Department of Public Safety Victim Service Program. It would include social workers from the Department of Social Development. And it also includes those from the domestic violence sector. So domestic violence outreach workers, second stage housing interveners and transition house interveners. And they can provide that support to individuals looking to get an emergency intervention order, again, to help enhance their safety. Okay. Excellent. Um, that's great. I think there's a couple of questions that I see here in the Q&A, and maybe we could deal with those while I'm, I'm looking at them. Um, I don't know if these questions are asked anonymously, so I won't mention any names, but um, there was a person asking, um, they're in an organization that's developing a similar uh, resource for raising awareness on the impact of, uh, of uh, violence in people's lives and in the workplace, and someone that they could communicate with from, from our um, from our committee, our contact information is uh, our for Lindsay and I is is right here in the last slide. You can flip us an email. I think we're going to share this uh, presentation as well. Flip an email, and we'll make sure that um, uh, that it goes to the uh, the right people to get you as much support as you need. And we're really happy to partner and share information. It's not about us kind of owning this information. It's about sharing it so people can use it. So we'd be happy to partner with someone and provide as much support as we can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question here I see um, asking, um, how many workplace HR departments have seen this, uh, uh, this webinar or had had training around this. And I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Lindsay, do you have any idea? I don't know how many, but I do know that we've done a number of, a number of trainings with some different organizations. So we did a number with uh, GNB Human Resources. We did it with their consultants. Um, we did a session with a local restaurant to help support their staff, but there's probably a lot more that we could do. We're also trying to link people up with some online resources for training, but if we were invited somewhere, we would be happy to do it, but we have done some sessions. I know that one of our members, Silke Brabander, has done a session for the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce. And I do believe that was recorded. There's also a couple sessions done for the NB Union and, and we're open to continuing to do that. It's all about that dissemination and getting it in the hands of people that can use it. I also had a discussion with somebody from the We'll say the hospitality industry, um, who was uh, experiencing a particular um, issue related to DIPV in in the workplace, and and they were amazed by this this resource and and lamenting the fact that when businesses start, there there is no starter kit um, about things you need to know once you employ people, once you have a workplace, um, you know, they were of the feeling that this is what we need at the beginning. So we can start to develop these, these policies around the, you know, the unfortunate eventualities of things that happen uh, in, in workplaces. So um, yeah, so some firsthand experience from folks like that. And I think in some of our planning, We've talked about uh, linking up with other chambers of commerce and also with the Human Resource Association of New Brunswick. So getting some of that information out there um, and we're working on it. If anyone knows of any good connections or you want to share this toolkit with others, please do so.
there was a question earlier. Um, uh, someone asked, it seems odd that the organization would keep an abuser. Um, this is a pattern can, that can be repeated with many other staff, right? That is true. And, and there are some things that we talk about and we often hear of zero tolerance policies. And, you know, in my heart, I think, yes, you know, there's an abuser, you want to fire them, get rid of them right away. However, we also know that that doesn't always happen. And that could also place the victim in an increased um, state of risk because we know unemployment is another lethality factor in domestic violence cases. The other thing is uh, an employee may be able to access EFAP programs, employment and family assistance programs in a workplace. But there are ways to deal with things in not supporting the violence or not validating it, saying things mm. like, I understand why you did it. I understand you got mad. No, no, no. There's no excuse for it. There's also, there also should be consequences for individuals who are using workplace assets to perpetrate the violence. If they're calling and harassing their partner on a company phone, if mm -hmm. they're using company time going. Yeah. Um, and wouldn't it be amazing if, if there could be intervention before it gets to the intervention of the criminal justice system? And I'm not saying that all perpetrators can change, but there is evidence that those that want to change with the help and proper support, not things like anger management, but um, proper programs for abusive partners, that they can change. So it, it can be a catch-22, but zero tolerance. But yes, we have zero tolerance to violence, but is it always in the best interest of everyone to get rid of that employee? Um, Keeping in mind that the continuum of, of abusive behavior, there may be some non-criminal um, uh, abusive behavior that the employer becomes aware of and, and some of these activities and policies kick in to help resolve that. And quite frankly, there are some, there, there are, some cases where the employee cannot be terminated. Um, so it's, it's, there are large swaths of, of gray. Um, and, and many times those decisions are not straightforward. And, uh, and so what Lindsay is saying about maintaining some ability to influence that abuser. Now, of course, we're talking about a very small workplace with one location and an abuser and a victim survivor, it, it seems like the options are fewer and fewer. Yeah. And everything is going to be based on the specific situation and circumstances. It's no one size fits all. But I think we need to look at victim safety as being a priority and being able to make sure a victim feels supported. Um, so kind of having that victim-centered approach, like Barry had mentioned, I think it is very important. And have that individual as part of the conversation yeah. looking for solutions. Great. Um, just going through some other Q&As, um, someone had asked, uh, oh, I had commented that uh, they were thinking about GMB Horizon, UNB Invested Moncton as places to distribute this toolkit, um, as well as being fit a good fit for smaller organizations as well, which I think is also quite relevant where you don't have like even just a starting the conversation, the hard conversations around these things. When you don't have an HR department, you really don't know where to start from. So even just having that um uh, that that lens on of what can I do for my employee is a really good starting point. Um, I think that's a great point because when this was designed, it was really designed to meet the needs of 
small businesses to large to unionize, non-unionize. And there's some things that small businesses can do without a whole HR department, like mm -hmm. put up resource numbers in the bathroom so mm -hmm. someone can access that information in private. So it might be little things, but it can make a difference. That's, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Silka also mentioned uh, people can also communicate directly to with the toolkit email address, which is info at toolkitnb.ca. Thank you for sharing that, Silka. And someone had messaged, mentioned the College of Counseling licensed uh, therapists in New Brunswick, which I'm assuming might be uh, another resource. Is there any other questions or comments? Um, so before we wrap up the presentation, um, thank you very much, first and foremost, Barry and Lindsay, this was really insightful. Um, and I really appreciated, uh, like I said, the, the, uh, the way that you're able to provide a lens for employers, small and large employers on how they can uh, support their employees. Um, and providing that trauma informed lens is, of course, very, very important. Um, so thank you very much for sharing your information. Um, at the end of this session, uh, or after this session, I will be sharing uh, the links, uh, email addresses, and the slides from this presentation. Um, and I'll also invite uh, everyone to complete an evaluation, and I'll be sharing the link uh, right now on in the chat. So I invite you to uh, complete that ev evaluation, which will also be sent uh, to everyone in a follow-up email. Um, so I'd like to, uh, if you would like to contribute, um, uh, if you'd like to contribute to the Mural McQueen Ferguson Center's ongoing efforts uh, to provide knowledge, uh, transfer and education events, uh, you can support us through the donation through the Ferguson Foundation. Uh, and you can vid vid bleh, visit uh, the donation page on CanadaHelps.org to direct your donations to the Mural McQueen Ferguson Center's fund. Oh, and Anya, <laughs> Tanya asked if there's any ch chance we can get the bios for Barry and Lindsay. Do you mind my sharing that with everyone? <laughs> with the Not group? at all. No? Okay. <laughs> Great. And I will put the CanadaHelps.org link to everyone. There we go. And I think we're all set. Thank you very much for your time again. And thanks to the participants. I think that we had a really good groups here. Um, <laughs> she says, Tanya says it was given so fast and so much information. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. This was really insightful. Um, and I look forward to seeing uh, evidence of your, uh, of your program a little bit everywhere. So thank you very much. Thank you, Danit. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.